Throughout the course of the semester, you'll use a variety of measurement devices, such as meter sticks, stopwatches, or balances, in order to measure a variety of quantities, such as distance, time, and mass. As you begin your laboratory experience, it's important that you realize that there will always be some uncertainty associated with any value that you measure. So in reality, the true goal in making a measurement in an experiment shouldn't necessarily be to find the right answer. Rather, it should be to find that your calculated value falls within the range of some accepted value. Consider the following questions. How tall are you? How old you are? Or how much you weigh? Each of these questions may at first glance appear to have a definite answer. But it's important to realize that each of these questions requires that a measurement be made in order for you to have a value to report. How would you go about measuring each of these quantities? What types of instruments would you use and what precision would those instruments have? Each of those questions will ultimately have an effect on the accuracy of the value that you report. While the actual values for each of these quantities may exist, in order for you to have a value to report, you'd have to make that measurement. So if you had a 10 foot pole to determine the height of a person, you might in comparison say that the person is about six feet tall. But if you had a more precise instrument, you might say that they were six feet one inch tall or six feet one and a quarter inch tall or six feet 1.2467 inches tall. As you increase the precision of the instrument you use to make the measurement, you get closer and closer to the quote actual value. Though with each measurement, you will still have an inherent uncertainty associated with that measurement. Where applicable, measurements should always be recorded as the best estimate plus or minus the total uncertainty, where the best estimate in this case is the arithmetic mean or what is commonly known as the average of the measured values. And the total uncertainty for a measured quantity for our purposes is the sum of the uncertainties of the instrument, the experimenter, and the random spread of the data. Each individual quantity that's measured in an experiment should be expressed along with a range of uncertainty by adding the individual uncertainties involved in the collection of the data. Namely, the inherent uncertainty of the instrument, which is primarily based on the instrument's precision. In addition, our own inherent uncertainty, which is primarily based on our ability to read or properly operate the instrument. And finally, the random uncertainty that results from collecting multiple data points of data in an experiment. Essentially, the inability to arrive at the exact same value for some measurement that has been made under the exact same conditions. Note that for your course, each uncertainty has a specific way to be determined. For the instrument's uncertainty, note that it is plus or minus 20% of the smallest division of the instrument. And whenever you see this smallest division, you should realize that we're referring to the precision of the instrument. For the experimenter's uncertainty, we estimate that it will be plus or minus 10% of the smallest division of the instrument. And finally, for the random uncertainty, you'll find that it is plus or minus the standard deviation from the mean of the measured values. Now, it's important for you to realize that the random uncertainty is only applicable if there, is, if there are multiple data points to report. That is, if there's only one value to be measured, then standard deviation isn't something that's applicable. And therefore, there is no random uncertainty to consider for that measurement. Now, when there are multiple measurements made and random uncertainty is something to consider, it might be helpful to understand what standard deviation actually is. You can think of standard deviation as the amount by which each measured value varies from the average of all of those values. To determine the standard deviation, you can either apply this equation and calculate it by hand, or it's suggested you become more familiar with your calculator so that you can have the calculator do all the work in determining the standard deviation of all of your measurements. Again, if only one measurement is made, then there is no average to consider and therefore there is no standard deviation of the measurements from the average because you've only made one measurement. Let's take a look at an example here. Consider the following time data collected for a ball that's dropped from a given height over three trials by using a stopwatch whose smallest division is one one hundredth of a second. 
So that's important to note that the smallest division of this instrument is one one hundredth of a second. In order for us to calculate the uncertainty, we'll need to know what that smallest division is for the instrument. Now, notice that because the instrument uncertainty and the experiment uncertainty are dependent on the smallest division of the instrument, you can determine these uncertainties before a measurement is even made. To calculate them, you will take 20% of the smallest division for the instrument uncertainty, or 0.2 times 0 0.01 seconds. Again, that smallest division is going to be one one hundredth of a second. The product of those gives you two one thousandths of a second. For the experimenter uncertainty, it's 10% or 0 0.10 times the smallest division of the instrument to yield one one thousandth of a second or one millisecond. The random uncertainty, however, is again the standard deviation of all the data that are measured for this experiment. So the standard deviation of these, plugging them into your calculator, you'll find is 0 0.046 seconds. To determine the total uncertainty, simply add each of those individual uncertainties, and you will find that for this particular measurement, you have an uncertainty of plus or minus 0 0.049 seconds, or about plus or minus 49 milliseconds. So what does that mean? You're attempting to determine the time that it takes the ball to fall from a height, and you'd like to be able to report a value. Well, if you recall, the best estimate, or the average of those values, can be reported along with the total uncertainty of those measurements to provide your reported value of, in this case, 0 0.52 seconds plus or minus 0 0.049 seconds. It's important for you to realize now that you're not given an exact value for the time it takes the ball to fall. Rather, you're given a range that is considered to be an acceptable range for the actual value for the measurement. So today's experiment will actually consist of taking two basic measurements, one for mass and one for height. We'll find throughout the semester that whenever taking any measurement, should always work to eliminate as much of the uncertainty as possible. And that's really today's main goal. The experiment is to work with determining the uncertainty in these measurements. Oftentimes, you can minimize the uncertainty involved with a measurement by taking steps to minimize or at least or try to eliminate the uncertainty by taking multiple measurements by uh, avoiding parallax error, that is taking ion measurements, we'll talk about that later on, and also trying to account for or avoid systematic errors that are involved in an experiment, such as using the rounded edge of a meter stick. So what we'll be doing to uh, work on taking into account uncertainty is we'll be taking the mass of a US quarter, we'll take, attempt to take the measurement of the mass of a US quarter, and the height of a lab table relative to the floor. Seemingly inconsequential measurements, but again, the overarching goal here is to work with uncertainty, to appreciate that uncertainty will always exist whenever a measurement is taken. And so we're gonna do some very basic measurements in order to, to try to work with that. The first thing that you'll do is you will determine the mass of an object. I mentioned a US quarter, it really could be any object. Um, the, depending on your setup, it could be different, but I'll be using as an example here a U.S. quarter dollar, and what we'll use to measure the mass of a U.S. quarter dollar will be a triple beam balance. Of course, this would be much easier if we had a digital balance that we could just put these on, but we, again, we kind of want to work with the process of taking the measurement. So we have a triple beam balance, and I'm sure you've worked with these before, but a quick refresh is that we should make sure before taking a measurement with a triple beam balance that we are actually are calibrated to read zero or to tear the instrument. You'll know, how, uh, you'll know if you require this by just simply taking a look at the armature here and seeing its position relative to the zero that's adjacent to it. For this instrument, it is approximately right on the, the value, and so I won't mess with it too much here. 
but likely when you get your triple beam balanced, you'll have to make some adjustments. And you can do that over here on the left side with the adjustment knob that's underneath of the pan. So when you have gotten your setup to read zero, make sure that before you take a measurement that all of your masses are, are, are moved over to their leftmost position. And you can place the object on the pan. Now, if we want to find the mass of an individual U.S. quarter, you might think, well, let's put an individual U.S. quarter on there. And we can certainly use the triple beam balance to determine the mass of that. But what we'd like to do is get a representative value for a U.S. quarter. This isn't a unique object. There are several U.S. quarters that are in circulation around the world. And what we're trying to do is get a representative value for the mass of a, of a quarter. So we could do one. But to get a representative value, it might be more effective to use multiple uh, objects that are effectively the same. So you'll be given multiple objects. In this case, I'll have five quarters on the balance. And you'll notice immediately that it's no longer in equilibrium. So we'll adjust that by moving the mass sliders. And one thing, if you recall, working with a triple beam balance that's important is that the when you move the mass on the armature, you need to make sure that it's in the groove. And you can just figure this out. You can determine if it is or not just by moving it side to side. But if it doesn't slide, then you're in the groove. And so I'll move the medium mass to the right-hand side. I still am above the equilibrium line, so I must need to go further. I go one more division. It's on the 20-gram division. It still hasn't gone below. I move one more division. It's on the 30, and now it's below. So I realize I have to step back. So it's going to be 20 something grams of the units that are uh, used here on this. Now I obviously won't use the larger mass because I'm already, I know that 10 more grams will set me over. So what I'll do is I'll use the, uh, the, the gram mass measurement uh, unit and move it along the side until I get close enough where I feel that it's about to bounce. And again, you're going to be looking here to, to make this measurement. And if you really want to do this properly, you should make an attempt to avoid the parallax error by making an ion measurement with this and making the adjustment here on the top. You'll find that it may waver a little bit, but it will quickly find its equilibrium position. And when it does, you want to make sure that the line on the armature matches up with the zero on the other side. So for efficiency's sake, I'll say that this is where I'd like to call the measurement. I'll come back over here on the other side, and if we could zoom in here, you'll see that we're getting a reading of 20 plus 0, because we didn't move this, plus 8 point, and it looks like it's 8.123 just before 8.4. So my interpretation of this, the last digit that you're going to report for your mass is effectively an estimate. And it'll be up to you to determine what that estimate is based on some tenth of a division between those smallest divisions. So for this reading, the way I looked at it, I'm going to say that it is not quite 8.4, but that it is just before that. So I'll say 8.39. My final best estimate reading for the mass of these five quarters will be 28.39 grams. Again, that last digit is going to be an estimation on your part. And that's one of the things that hopefully you can realize immediately, that there is uncertainty inherent to every single measurement that you're going to make. Later on, we'll take into account the uncertainty with the uncertainty calculation, so you'll be given a reported value plus or minus some value that you've determined to be the uncertainty. Don't forget, though, there are five quarters on this balance. And as a result, I need to take that value and divide it by the number of objects that I have in the pan. So in this case, 28.39 divided by 5, which gives me a value of 5.1678. Now, that goes all the way out to the 10,000th place. But my instrument can only read out as far as we're going to, in this case, a hundredth of a gram. We're estimating that last digit. So I'll make sure to report that as... 5.17 grams as the best estimate for an individual U.S. quarter. So keep in mind that you, uh, there, there will be an uncertainty with this measurement. There will be different values for each person that makes this measurement. Once you've made the measurement, it's important that you return the balance 
to, for all those masses on the bounce to the zero position. And your lab mate will then make their own measurement. You'll go through this one turn with everyone making the measurement, and then each member will then again make another measurement for the mass of an individual U.S. quarter. So the mass part is relatively straightforward, and what you'll do later on is you'll take those data. So you'll have roughly 14 people in the lab group in total, and each person making two measurements will give you approximately 28 values for the mass of a quarter, and those will be your data. You can either do this as a class, or you can do this as an individual group, but you'll have multiple data sets, uh, multiple data points, rather. So you will apply the uncertainty calculation, which involves the uncertainty of the instrument, which is based on the smallest division, so it's important that you can pay attention and mark the division, and note the division, the smallest division on your instrument. In this case, it would appear to be a tenth of a gram. And you'll also take into account the experimenter's uncertainty, which is a percentage of that smallest division as well. And finally, you'll take into account the standard deviation of all of those values in determining the random uncertainty, collectively giving you the total uncertainty for that mass measurement. Similarly, when we go to take the mass, uh, rather, when we go to determine the height of a lab table relative to the ground, you're going to be doing it in very much the same fashion. Each group member will take a single measurement for the, in this case, the height of the lab table, and you will then rotate. And once everyone has made the measurement, you'll then repeat that again with each group member taking two measurements. But obviously, we're measuring a different quantity here, and that is height, so we'll be using the meter stick for this. You know that the smallest division for your meter stick reads to the millimeter, or the one thousandth of a meter. That'll be important, again, when you're determining the total uncertainty of your measurement. So, first thing you should do is to make sure that the zero end of the meter stick is facing the floor so that you don't have an issue in misinterpreting the value that you do read here. The other thing to take into account, there's an opportunity for error here, is to make sure that the side of the meter stick is as flush with the side of the lab table as you can reasonably get it to be. I'll exaggerate this for a bit here. What we don't want is for the meter stick to be, say, too far in, or for the meter stick to be too far out. That'll affect, obviously, where we make a measurement or a reading on the meter stick. So attempting to get this as flush as possible to the side will help to minimize greatly the, uh, the error that's associated with this measurement. Now, this again, is an ion measurement that will be required here. You want to avoid, again, the parallax error associated with reading a measurement at an angle that is not going to give the accurate value. So to do this, I'm going to get over here on the side, and I'm going to utilize a straight edge here. In this case, I have a protractor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this straight edge to measure the top of the lab table, because you'll find that there'll be a bevel here on the edge. Where exactly are you measuring if you're trying to get the height of the table? Well, we want to get the top of the table. So I will use a straight edge here to try to get a value of, of where this is on the meter stick. And I see that it is at least to the 70, to the 76, and it looks like it is right on the 76.2 centimeter marker. Again, that last digit is going to be an estimate on your behalf. So if I find the table to be 76.2 centimeters exactly, or that it falls right on the two, then I will report that as 76.20 centimeters. That zero indicates my interpretation of the precision using the meter stick, in this case, to measure the height. Not only will you make a measurement, uh, so you'll make your first measurement at one location, and, but it is suggested that your lab mates will then choose to make a measurement at a different location on your lab table. And when it comes time for you to make your second measurement, that you still choose a different location yet again. It's important when you do use your straight edge to make this measurement that you read from the bottom of your straight edge, because that's actually what's in contact with the surface of the lab table. For this measurement, again, you'll have approximately, if there are 14 students in the lab section, you'll have approximately 28 data points for the height of a lab table. And while there are different lab tables, we will assume them to effectively be identical, that they are the same, and that these measurements are uh, related to each other. So 
to summarize, you'll have approximately 28 data points, depending on how you do this. If you work within your group, there could be three or four students for a total of six to eight data points for each the mass of a quarter and the height of, a, of the table. Or your lab section may use all the data for the class, which means you'll have approximately 28 data points for the mass of a quarter and 28 data points for the height of a table. You will use those data points to determine the random uncertainty portion of the total uncertainty. That is, you will determine the standard deviation of all those data points, and that will be one component of the uncertainty involved with the measurement, which obviously also encompasses the uncertainty of the instrument and the uncertainty of the experiment.